standby. Good day, everyone, and welcome to today's presentation on the fundamentals of clinical research in the CPM. This session will be recorded. All participant lines will remain in a listen-only mode. However, questions and comments are encouraged and enabled by pressing star 1 on your telephone. If you experience technical difficulty, please press star 0 for assistance. Now I'd like to direct the audience to force their screen to full view by pressing the small icon located on the bottom right corner of your screen. You're looking for a blue fox with arrows pointing out from the corners. Please click that icon now to bring the presentation to full view. At this time, I'll turn the podium over to Liz Buttry. Please go ahead, ma'am. Okay, welcome everyone. I'm Liz Buttry, the training coordinator for the Clinical Coordinating Center, and I'd like to take a quick moment to thank Ron Jackson and Christy Thomas for presenting with us today and sharing their expertise with us. What I would like to do is, um, as the operator said, the, op the lines are in a listen-only mode, but your questions and comments are welcome. Just press star 1 to um, present your question verbally, or if you'd like to use the QA feature, it's right up here at the top of the screen. You can type in your message there, and then I will answer the questions in turn, or I will present them to Ron and Christy in turn, and um, make those available to them. So if um, there's no questions at this time, I will go ahead and turn the presentation over to Ron. Okay, so hi everybody and welcome. Uh, Christy and I are very happy to have you here. and. Uh, um, we look forward to this, these next two hours. Um, so first of all, uh, here's about how to do questions or comments. We've talked about this already, but uh, we, we just want to encourage your questions or comments throughout this as we go along. This will work a lot better as, as a discussion rather than just Christy and I moving smartly through these, uh, these next set of slides. Um, there are um, a lot of uh, um, uh, knowledgeable people attending this uh, webinar, and so we really encourage you all to participate. Um, as I said earlier, it's a two-hour seminar, and uh, we, we focus this to, for people who are relatively new uh, research staff in the CTN and who are also new to the research environment of the CTN. And so we're going to focus on not only research practices, but research practices within the CTN as delivered in these things called clinical treatment programs or community treatment programs. Um, so um, let's let's move along here now and and uh, talk about some of our questions. And our first question is, who are you guys? All right, Ron. I'm going to go over to the polling questions right here. Okay. So this question, if you could, if you wouldn't mind, um, indicate your current position right now. So, so far, about a third of the folks are research assistants, and that's terrific because that's really our target audience. And we see that we have some people who are also uh, counselors and therapists in community treatment programs, and some RRTC staff. I'm kind of curious about who some of the other are. So if some of you who have answered other, I'd like to know what other means, please. Other could possibly mean the um, Data and Statistical Center. We have staff from there. Okay. Uh, we have staff attending from the Clinical Coordinating Center. At least those are um, some of the positions from the registrant. All righty. What do you think? You ready to go to the next slide, Ron? Yeah, why not? So the next slide asks you all to let us know a little bit about your experience in, in uh, clinical trials. So let me take a little bit of time while the polls are still open. <laughs> this is a cool little aspect, uh, Liz. Yeah, isn't this pretty nice? Yeah. I have it, uh, the polls are open and I have it um, showing the results so that everybody sees the information as it's accumulated. That's great. 
Well, there's uh, certainly a lot of experience here in clinical trials uh, in this uh, in this on this webinar today, so that's gratifying. All right, let's go over to see what their experience is in DCTN. Okay. So that's the uh, the third polling question here. Right. So those polls are open, and I'm now showing those polling results. All right, Ron, I'm going to jump off and help a couple people via email. Okay. Turn the ball over to you. I'll put you right back into your presentation. Looks like we have 58% attendance with zero to one year's experience within the CTN. Right. So, uh, so what we've learned from you all is that uh, this is about, about a third of the audience are research assistants, and the others uh, come from RRTCs and data centers and the like and uh, that there's a considerable amount of research experience on the webinar today, but about uh, a, good, a little bit more than half of you are relatively new, that is within a year of uh, being in the CTN. And so um, it feels like we've kind of pitched this in, in exactly the right order here. So um, with that, I'm going to uh, move along now to uh, to, uh, and turn it over to Christy. So here you go, Christy. Okay. Thanks, Brian. So hello, everyone. And I just, you know, this is the first time that I spoke to you today, so I want to say good morning and afternoon to some, depending on where you are in the country. But um, I just want to share that I feel very honored to be asked to present um, for you today and to be presenting with um, Ron Jackson. I think. Um, this is a very great topic that we're discussing, the fundamentals of research um, in the CTN. And so I just want to mention that, you know, I was very pleased to see the polling questions as well to know that we have some very experienced folks out there in, in the audience who really have um, a vast amount of knowledge, six plus years knowledge of research and in the CTN. And so what we want to do, and Ron and I know he spoke about this earlier, is welcome you to participate. I know the lines are closed, but feel free to press star one if you have a comment um, because we definitely want to use this as an opportunity to share and not just kind of be speaking heads um, for Ron and I. Um, in terms of the plan for today, uh, we're going to basically start out with four topics. We're going to start out with an uh, overview of the CTN, its structure, its origin, what this monster animal of the CTN is all about. And uh, we'll move into a topic talking about the research team, the configura configuration of our staffing matrices at the sites and at the RTCs, and, and how we all kind of come together um, to work on projects. And then we'll move into what I think is basically the heart of our discussion, which will be the research protocol, because a lot of the fundamentals that we'll be talking about is really embodied into the protocol that you'll be working on and that you see. And so what we've done is we've broken out various sections of the protocol to kind of highlight some of those fundamental concepts. And so that's how we'll walk through the training today. And then we'll end up by talking about topic four, which is just how to navigate this massive network to ensure your success. Because really that's what our goal is. Our target audience uh, was intended to be um, novice researchers, folks who are new to the CT and new to research. And what we kind of conceptualized, what I conceptualized in my mind is what kinds of things would you want to share with someone in terms of what they could do um, to make their job or make their efforts more successful in terms of doing quality research uh, within a clinical trial within the CTN. And so that's basically our overview of what we'll be talking about today. So, and then what you'll find is I'm a little wordy at times, so if you need me to slow down or I've said too much, feel free to somehow indicate that on the screen or, you know, chime in and we'll definitely move through it. So that was the outline. And I'll move on to the next slide, which Oh, we have more polling questions. Is that right? Oh, you got to you got to hit the down one. Oh, okay. Hit the down button right there. You go. Okay, so Ron is going to talk to us about the CT and overview. Yeah, that's great. And and you've seen some polling questions already, and and there are are other polling questions 
throughout this uh, presentation so 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 we get some feedback in real time about uh, whether or not you all are, are getting the information that we think is important and, and so that we're making sure that we're on target. So it, it's my job uh, to talk about the CTN. Uh, as probably everybody on the call knows, I'm the CTP or Community Treatment Program representative to the steering committee from the Pacific Northwest node. and. Uh, have been on the steering committee since its inception. I'm also on the executive committee of the of the CTN. Um, so I set the way back machine back to 1998, when uh, a, uh, a section of the Institute of Medicine uh, issued a report called Bridging the Gap. And in this report, which was uh, chaired by uh, actually two uh, people who went on to be um, very fundamental members of the CTN, both uh, Mitch Greenlick, who was the former principal investigator for the um, Oregon node, and uh, Dennis McCarty, who is the current PI for that particular node, were the uh, editors of this report, and many of the contributors to the report went on to be essential players in the CTN. This, this report basically uh, took the National Institute on Drug Abuse to task for um, it, it, the inefficiency with which it was moving um, research findings into community practice. And that Bridging the Gap report became the impetus for the then director of NIDA, uh, uh, Dr. Alan Leshner, to uh, put out an RFA that um, basically began the infrastructure building for the clinical trials network. Uh, it was uh, Dr. Lesner's vision to uh, use science as the vehicle for improving treatment in communities around the country. And, and that was, was the original vision, and we'd like to believe that that's still the vision, that the overall purpose of the CTN is to improve community-based treatment. Um, and so in that first RFA and in all subsequent RFAs, that the structure has remained basically the same. The funding institute, of course, is NIDA, and within NIDA was, was uh, formulated a specific center uh, called the Center for the Clinical Trials Network that has been headed by its inception by Dr. Betty Tai, who, who came to NIDA. She's been at NIDA for a while and came to NIDA from the FDA. And, and uh, she works, has worked diligently over all of these years to, to build a staff and to, and to nurture the growth and um, efficiency of, this, of the CCTN. Um, there are many players within the CCTN, and time doesn't permit uh, listing all of them, but it is their hard work that uh, keeps, the, uh, keeps the wheels running in the clinical trials network. Working for the Center for the Clinical Trials Network are three um, logistical consulting companies. The, the first is the Clinical Coordinating Center, or EMIS, and, and uh, Liz Buttry works for EMIS, and they do things like you're experiencing right now. Um, they conduct webinars, they provide uh, trainings, they, a variety of different things. They are the the, the feeder to all, all of us of, of a, a number of important training and logistical kinds of things. Uh, Synergy, uh, Synergistics uh, is responsible for handling meetings. So for those of you who are going to the uh, steering committee meeting and, and allied meetings later on this month, you've probably seen that coordinated through SEI. And then last, but certainly not least in this particular line of the structure is the Data Coordinating Center. Uh, it is uh, the Duke Clinical for Research. I can't remember what DCRI stands for, but it, it's the folks uh, in Duke, and uh, they are the people who handle the INFORM system and all of the electronic data capture and are responsible for uh, uh, collecting the data from the trials that uh, we're all conducting. And then there's the CTN itself and its own structure. And, and within the CTN, there are these uh, 16 nodes that exist and that uh, ha are, are led by principal investigators. And uh, each 
node is represented on the steering committee by uh, two representatives, the principal investigator and the community treatment program representative that has been selected within the node to represent the other community treatment programs within that node. Um, this is the body that meets typically twice a year, sometimes three times a year if there's a blending meeting. Uh, and it will uh, discuss a variety of, of issues. It has often been the place where, where um, clinical trials have been um, conceptualized and discussed and formulated and, and certainly monitored. And so the CTN is an important body in this process, and, and it acts in coordination with the Center for the Clinical Trials Network. Uh, the next subunit of the CTN are the various nodes. And, and the nodes are, are basically uh, situated in academic uh, institutions around the country. Um, the principal investigator typically is, uh, works for those academic institutions, whether they're University of Washington or UCLA or Yale or so forth and so on, Medical University of South Carolina. Um, and they are the grantees. They are the people that NIDA um, funds directly uh, through contracts uh, to operate both, both to operate trials and to provide the funding for the infrastructure of the nodes. Uh, each node typically has uh, multiple um, researchers who work within the node who become the, the program or the uh, protocol coordinators uh, for, uh, for protocols that are being operated by that node, for example, the stage 12 study um, done in a number of, of uh, community treatment programs across the country is led by Dr. Dennis, Dennis Donovan, who is the principal investigator of the Pacific Northwest node. And uh, Anthony Floyd, uh, Dr. Anthony Floyd, um, is the protocol coordinator, and he's also employed by our node. He does a number of other different things in our node. And so the node typically employs uh, researchers, data analysts, uh, sometimes research assistants, study coordinators, and the like. And they typically are employees of universities. Um, now, working within each node, conceptualized as the sites of these treatment, uh, of these protocols, are the community treatment programs, or CTPs. Um, and each node in its applications for funding is responsible for uh, generating a cadre of community treatment programs that represent different modalities. For example, residential treatment program, opioid treatment programs, outpatient psychosocial programs, detoxification programs, and the like. And those community treatment programs become the sites of these uh, trials. And this circles right back to Dr. Leshner's vision about using science as the vehicle. The, the purpose of having community treatment programs and not specialized laboratory type programs being the site for these protocols is that you want to test these uh, protocols, these interventions in real world settings with real world clinicians and real world patients. And so, it is our job as community treatment providers to, to be the sites of these studies. And that has been um, a blessing and a challenge to all of us because in some cases it brought a, a higher level of, of kind of paperwork rigor to our sites than, than we were used to. In many cases it brought in new staff, sometimes, certainly almost all the time, research assistants and other allied staff as well. But those are the places where the protocol takes place, overseen by the nodes and the RRTCs, overseen by the, the CTN steering committee, and then ultimately overseen by uh, the Center for the Clinical Trials Network and facilitated by those boxes of, the, of MS, SEI, and DCRI. Um, so that's about what I want to say. Christy, anything you want to add to that? Oh, that was great, Ron. I mean, I, <laughs> I enjoyed that very thorough um, explanation. I guess one of the things that when I started with the CT, and I didn't have the benefit of hearing um, from Ron Jackson to kind of describe um, the structure. And so some of it, uh, many times what I've learned is that staff come in 
and and they kind of get thrown either into the uh, R to C level or the CTP, and then they learn it as they go. And so it could be a very overwhelming experience for some. And so one of the things that I'm also sensitive to, Ron, is that um, our terminology sometimes um, is very foreign to folks who are outside of the CT, and we talk in a lot of acronyms. And, and, and so one of the things that I did when I was talking about um, this presentation was some of uh, my coworkers here at UCLA about, you know, do you remember what it was like when you first came into the CT and what kinds of things would you have wanted to know to kind of help smooth that process out? And one of them was just like knowing, having people talk in English, you know, I mean, we're, we're talking in um, these words that are not familiar to most. And so I just want to put that out there to, to you guys that if you're new to the CT and you may be hearing us speak in that way, but that's the lingo that you'll catch on very quickly to. And oftentimes in your protocol, you'll see a list of abbreviations and acronyms, and, and some of it you can get um, that way. But that's one of the things that I felt um, a little o overwhelmed by when I first joined the CTN. And then the structure itself. I mean, the structure is a little different today than it was maybe five or six years ago with the integration of the clinical coordinating centers. Um, but it, it, there's a lot of names. There's a lot of um, uh, voices that you hear on calls. There's a lot of um, names that you see via email. And I think it's just really neat what you did, Ron, which is just to basically explain the flow. Uh, because when we're doing our work out there, either in the CTP or the RTC, it's important to know who to go to and where and how kind of the lines of authority go, uh, sort of the chain of command. And so I think seeing that structure, seeing this um, slide, I think was very helpful for that. So, yes. Christy, yes. in here real quick. i got two questions. Um, sure. One, the um, DCRI stands for um, the data um, do Clinical Research Institute? Yeah. Okay, I might yeah. got tied up there. So Debbie wanted to um, clarify that for us. And I also have a question saying, is it possible to print the slides um, on screen? And there is an, an option at the bottom, the right-hand corner of your screen, uh, right next to the, the blue box with the arrows pointing out from it, there's a print um, option right there. So you can click um, print, and it'll print it to a PDF file for you. Okay, that, that was all I have right now. Great, thanks. All right. I'll turn it back over to you. I didn't have anything more to add to that. All right, thanks. And the, the, one of the takeaway messages here is that there's a big formal structure and there are a lot of people involved and, uh, and it, it takes a village. <laughs> so here is uh, an iteration of the, of the various levels of the research team. Um, as th there are a number of experienced people on this webinar, and as you all know, uh, all research has to have a sponsor. That's the people that are the entity that's paying the bills. Uh, and in some cases, the people in, in a medication trial, the person that's holding the, uh, the uh, investigational new drug license, for example. And, and for all of the clinical trials, the sponsor is the National Institute on Drug Abuse. That's from whence the funds come, and that's why the, the, the Center for the Clinical Trials Network pays as close attention to everything as they do. Within um, the uh, research protocol itself, there is very commonly an executive committee um, that has been articulated as the protocol was developed uh, and they, that executive committee is comprised of a number of individuals. Uh, clearly, the principal investigator and, and uh, her or his uh, uh, colleagues inform that, as, as well as other principal investigators from other nodes, the, sort of the heads of the RRTC, um, also certainly community treatment programs. DCRI and MS are, are always represented on these executive committees and other allied individuals. And they um, meet very frequently as the protocol is getting uh, developed and then initiated, and then uh, continue to meet on a regular basis. For example, in a protocol that I'm currently involved with, uh, the START study, the executive committee meets by conference call 
uh, on a monthly basis. There was a time when we were meeting more frequently than that. And they are the, uh, th that is the entity that often makes uh, decisions about protocol amendments. We'll say more about that a little bit later on. But they have a lot of power uh, to assist and consult with the principal investigator of the particular study. Um, there is the uh, um, uh, protocol lead investigator. It's, it's not even listed on here, but, but it's very, very important. Um, the, 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 no, the protocol lead investigator, for example, in the START study, that's Dr. Walter Ling, assisted by Dr. Uh, Andy Saxon, is the person that is overall responsible for the entire study. And they lead the protocol team, and in most cases, they also lead the executive committee. That's the, that's the person that's really ultimately responsible to NIDA for the conduct of the trial, everything from the science to the budget and so forth and so on. Typically working for that individual is the protocol director. This is the person who assists that uh, protocol lead investigator with the study coordination. For example, in the START study that uh, Dr. Ling is, uh, is, has uh, as his protocol director Al Hassan from, uh, the, uh, from UCLA. Uh, and Al works in very close collaboration with Christy Thomas. Um, they all work in the lead node. So for every protocol, one node takes the lead. Sometimes that lead node responsibility has been shared between two nodes. Most of the time, it's a single node that does that. And as, as I said earlier, uh, UCLA and the Pacific node is a classic example as it relates to the START study. Um, that lead node um, has um, a, a number of responsibilities, and they make sure that the protocol is working smoothly. But, but they're also uh, helped in this by the node principal investigator and that person's team. So. In the case of the START study, it's distributed through a number of different nodes, and each of those nodes has a node principal investigator who is responsible for the conduct of the study and, and assists the lead node and the lead PI in that. And one of the principal concepts, constructs in, in the CTN is what's called node autonomy. And so it's really up to each node to make its own decisions about its own organizational structure and organization. And so sometimes the titles are different from one node to another. Sometimes the job descriptions of, of, of a, uh, a particular job title may vary from one node to the other. Uh, and, and that's the way that it goes. Now, the node principal investigator, of course, is just responsible for the node. They may or may not be involved at all uh, very much in the operation of a particular protocol within their node other than to ensure that it's being operated properly. They may not have much day-to-day -day interaction. That day-to-day -day interaction with the protocol, a particular study within a node is, is given over to the protocol PI. Um, that person is responsible for the operation of that protocol within that node. That person is assisted also by the node protocol coordinator, uh, who is a staff, typically a staff person of the Regional Research and Training Center, or RRTC, who, uh, who assists that uh, protocol PI and the node PI to make sure that the business is running smoothly. And then last but not least is the, is the, the principal investigator at the community treatment program. That's the person who is responsible for the operation of the study at that particular site. So for example, I'm the CTP PI for the START study. That means that ultimately I'm responsible for how this thing is happening within my clinic. And so when we have uh, node PI or node protocol uh, calls, I get on the phone call with Al Hassan and Christy Thomas, who are from the lead node, 
and and uh, and Anthony Floyd, Dr. Anthony Floyd, is the um, uh, the uh, protocol coordinator for our node, and he's on the call along with the research assistants who work with me here at at my community treatment program, and we talk about recruitment and retention and other protocol issues. Um, so the take-home message here for all of this is, first of all, to know what your role is, where you fit into this scheme of things. Know what the other people are, what roles other people who are in your protocol have, and where to go for help. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Christy and say, first of all, Christy, have you got anything more to add to what I just talked about? Oh, no, that's great. Uh, so just moving then to which is um, a further breakdown of the staff that you might see at a typical CPP. And like Ron said, based on sort of the structure within a node, these titles may differ. So you may see, um, and then the other part of it is that really depending on the nature of the study, um, the roles that are needed for that particular protocol may differ. For example, Ron talked about the START study. And so in the START study, there's a lot of blood draws that occur um, as a part of the protocol, and so there's a need for a phlebotomist. Um, other studies are more behavioral. There may be, not be a need for certain medical staff and a phlebotomist and things like that. And so really the nature of the protocol drives the staffing matrix at the CTP. And so you see the listing of names there, and I would just share that typically a lead team would put together a recommendation for the local study team in terms of what they've conceptualized the study to be and the sorts of roles that will be needed in order to move the protocol forward. And so you would typically see that maybe in a training plan or an operations manual. Uh, but that information is shared. But again, uh, the node would structure it um, as, as they saw fit based on what their local policies um, and guidelines might be. The thing that I would also kind of mention here is that the listing on the slide really talks about the research staff. And so what we are aware of, we're talking about research in the real world. We're talking about doing clinical trials and community treatment program settings. And so the staff that you don't see on the slide are some of the non-research staff, some of the clinical um, treatment staff. And so one of the things that I would just mention here is that they're, they're not, they may be absent from the slide per se, so really the reality is that this is a team effort. And so the research team includes the research staff, who you'll see on the delegation roster and the staff um, listing roster, um, but also the clinical treatment program staff. And one of the things that I think is important is that sometimes that's a challenge. I think Ron mentioned earlier that we've brought these research into these real world settings and it has been a blessing and a challenge in ways. So what you usually find is that research brings new people, it brings more people, and sometimes new patients, different patients, people that, you know, you may not necessarily be used to seeing within your community treatment program setting. It brings a host of new activities, new rules, new paperwork, um, sometimes new supervisors, new staff, and sometimes it impacts the CTP and if there's changes in office space, there's um, resource sharing that needs to happen. And so essentially more work, which sometimes can be viewed um, not so positively by the receiving end. And so I think what's important is just to note that there sometimes can be challenges and that it's important to be sensitive and aware of those and to strategize early on in the study about ways to bring the whole team together and to um, deal with some of those um, perceived barriers, which, which don't appear to be barriers because we've been doing this sort of work in the CTN for, I think, I don't know, is it almost 10 years or so, uh, Ron? It is 10 years. Yeah, 10 years. So um, many of our CTPs are used to this, and so the staff are pretty research savvy at this point. But sometimes those they, they may not have that sort of experience in research or may not even understand some of the rules of research. And so it really is incumbent upon the research team to collaborate, to share, to set up um, meetings and, and, and review sessions where um, 
the whole team kind of shares in the protocol that it's not seen as something outside of the CTP, but it really is something that the CTP does together with the researchers and the CTPs. And so that's what I want to mention about the staff. Uh, Ron, is there something that you wanted to add to that that I didn't hit on? Well, um, one of the criticisms about uh, research and community practice had been that the research just, researchers just sort of parachute in from time to time run their study without really any concern about its impact on the rest of the CTP staff and then leave and take their data with them. And one of the one of the concentrated efforts from the inception of the CTN was to avoid that problem, avoid that concern. Um, so that in many cases that's why research assistants are actually employees of the community treatment program and that the therapists and counselors in a particular study, whether this is a medication trial or a behavior trial or, or a combination, are drawn from existing agency staff. So as to weave this study more into the daily life of the community treatment program, which helps with recruitment and retention and operation of the study and a variety of different things. And, and lastly, that uh, this is again circling back to Dr. Leshner's vision, that after the study is over that the lessons learned within that study remain within that community treatment program and hopefully will improve the practices of that particular community treatment program. Okay. So I think before we move on, I think we have another polling question, right, Liz? Great. Right. So if you see that question on your screen, if you can just indicate um, what the answer to the question is. So in the research team, the important point is which of the following. So know your role, know the role of others, know where to go for help, or all of the above. So, and I think for the most part, we got pretty much 100% um, of folks saying all of the above which is something that Ron emphasized during his presentation, that you want to know your role and know the role of others and, and basically where to go to help. Um, great. So we'll move on. Okay. So now let's move into topic three, which is really, I think, going to be the heart of our discussion, and we'll talk about um, the protocol and the various elements of the protocol and how that relates to the fundamental concepts of doing good quality um, research. And so the basis of that really is the research protocol. Without a protocol, you don't have a study. So every well-designed clinical trial requires a protocol. And the contents of that protocol really um, contain the background, they specify the objectives and why we're doing the study, describes the design, um, and the organizational of the trial, and it kind of provides, like you see on the screen, the essential aspects of the proposed research. It really is the key to ensuring the standardization, which is really important in a multi-center trial where you have more than one center um, attempting to conduct the same research that we need um, a roadmap, um, a guide, if you will. And that really is the protocol. And so one of the things that we emphasize uh, with all of the research team at every level is that you want to read the protocol. And then once you read it, you want to read it again. You want to read it basically several times over the course of the study because oftentimes when you read it the first time, you kind of get a, a basic understanding of it. And um, you read it again, I find myself pulling out things that didn't occur to me maybe even um, the first time that I read it. And so it kind of unfolds to you as you go. And so you want to read it often. Now. Every detail that explains how to do the trial, I mean, it says here, it specifically describes the five W's, which I think is a sort of a journalism, the five W's. But there also is an H, so the five W's and the H, and the H is really how. And that's usually found in the operations manual. So every detail of how to carry out a trial doesn't need to be in the, in the protocol, provided that there's a comprehensive operations manual that's going to give those details, which are basically the how-to's of how to do the things that the protocol calls for. And so a protocol requires approval from your IRB and initially before you can start the trial. And of course, it requires approval of any amendments that occur during the course of the trial in addition to annual approval. And so the purpose of this call isn't to talk about the regulatory aspects because I understand that there are other 
webinars or trainings that have been conducted or will be conducted that will go more over into the regulatory aspects of it. But the purpose here is really just to say that the protocol is your guide. And often when I get questions from sites about the protocol or a, a way to do a certain assessment or the way um, or whether or not something can be done or whether or not this person is appropriate for the study, I always like to say, well, let's see what the protocol said. And we start there, and if that question is not sufficiently answered by the protocol, then we go to the secondary document. So you'll have uh, an operations manual. You typically have uh, standard operating procedures that might spell out in further details exactly how that um, procedure will be implemented at that particular CTP. And so all these documents together, I think, provide for a very solid basis for conducting the research study. Um, the protocol development team really, um, that Ron mentioned earlier on, and kind of the whole um, delineation of how we get to where we are, is that there's a protocol development team, usually members of the executive committee, other folks from the steering committee, folks from the clinical coordinating center, the data center, get together and develop a protocol. And so a lot of the fundamental aspects of how good research is done is already embedded there. So, and how the study is designed, what the research question is, who the target population is that we're studying. And so if we adhere to that, we should be in a good place. So we're ethically and professionally obligated to follow the protocol. And if we break the rules, we basically compromise the research. And in the end, we may have more difficulty determining whether or not the intervention works. And so that's kind of just what I wanted to say about the protocol. And I'll ask Ron, if you have anything else to add to that. Oh, I, I think that's, that's got it. Yeah. Okay. So as we move further into the presentation, I think, Ron, you're going to take care of the research question? Yep. Uh, it's, it's Matt's me. Um, so um, it, it is the research question that is the, the critical um, element to this. It really does inform how the study is designed. Uh, I hate to bore you all with using the START study as an example, but it's a current one for me and it's one that I know fairly well. The research study question in START is, are there any differential effects on liver function between the two uh, medications approved for the use of opioid uh, dependence by the FDA? And that would be buprenorphine in its uh, sublingual form called Suboxone versus methadone. That's the question, and so once you have the question, um, that that really kind of informs about how you go about constructing the trial. Uh, everything about that, how often bloods need to be drawn, by whom, what kind of data need to be, other data need to be collected, does the ingestion of this medication need to be observed, and so forth and so on, is, is really all turns on what the research question is. And, and when the protocol team, or even before that, when the concept development team, because typically within the CTN, first there's a research idea or concept where, where um, researchers coupled with community treatment providers say, Here's an issue that we're facing in our community, and, and we'd like to apply science to this particular question to see if there's a better way to, uh, to address this particular issue. And so the, the, a protocol design emerges from a need in the community, a scientific question, a, a community need question, and, and, and then this iterative, iterative process called the protocol development and then implementation begins. And so it, it, in the case of START, this was a question that was asked uh, by the FDA uh, to the manufacturers. And so it became a, 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 a process by which uh, the protocol development team began to look at how to do the study design to answer that particular question. Um, in the stage 12 study, the protocol, uh, the, the study question really was about uh, is, is uh, the development of 12-step facilitation, uh, which is not necessarily the same thing as just going to meetings, is that, is that, does that materially improve uh, addiction treatment? and so forth and so on. And so that's really important 
uh, to start with a question. And then after that comes this idea of what's called background and significance. The, the concept development team and ultimately the protocol development team um, is responsible for looking at what science has said about that, those particular questions in the past. What, what do we know about 12-step facilitation? Um, well, well, we know that it was used as an intervention in, in a study that, that focused on alcoholics, uh, for example, uh, Project Match. How does that translate to, to using this particular intervention with people who are multiply drug dependent? Uh, is there something that we need to know about that? And, and, and how will this particular research protocol, the one that's going to be operated in the CTN, help inform the science? What kind of questions will be answered by this? So understanding and reading the background and significant portion of the protocol, of the study, is, is really an important um, step for all members of the protocol team to do, whether you're um, a, a research clinician, whether you're a research assistant, uh, whatever your role, it, this is, helps you understand what the rationale is for this particular study. And, and that's, that's really an important piece, particularly as it relates to informed consent. So I'm going to turn it over to Christy and have her talk about informed mm -hmm. consent in this process. Mm -hmm. Right. Thank you, Ron. So the, the point being that, that Ron just made about the background and significance and everyone uh, should know what that is. And I just think that's interesting for me um, as someone who started off as a research assistant, spent a lot of time as a coordinator working um, in the studies, con consenting participants, bring them into the trial. That, and then earlier having said, read the protocol, read the protocol, read the protocol. I think if any section of the protocol is probably the least read by maybe frontline staff, it's probably the background and significant section. You know, typically what I would do and I, what I used to do is just go start with the, the study um, objectives and the study procedures and you go there and that's really where you live because that's going to dictate what you do. But the thing that I think is important and I just want to emphasize here is that that background and significance section has a lot of bearing on your informed consent process. And so what it would be useful to know is like, well, why are we doing this study? And how did we arrive at this point? Why this particular intervention? Because I think a well-informed participant is sometimes a better participant. You get them to adhere to the study more often when they know what it is they're doing. Of course, we have the ethical obligation, the regulatory obligation for informed consent, but I just think it's a useful thing to keep in mind that as a research assistant or coordinator, spending some time in the background and significant section of your protocol will give you more tools and more information to have a more thorough discussion with a potential participant who's considering participating in that study. And so I just encourage you to go and to use that. And of course, um, not wanting to gloss over the informed consent process in general, I understand that, you know, most of you have probably, hopefully been through good clinical practice training, and so you've had that, or, and oftentimes your institution will require certain human subject protections training, and so you've been indoctrinated with the importance of the consent process. But I just emphasize here that it really is a process of educating and informing a potential participant about the risk and benefits of participation, inviting them, their voluntary participation in the study, and then documenting that with that informed consent form. But it really isn't the form itself. It really is a process of, of, of information sharing um, that occurs uh, when you invite a participant into the trial. And so I won't spend much more time on that, but you just want to make sure that that really is a thorough process. So I think we're moving on to the study design and procedures, and um, I think, let's see, what do we want to say about that? Really, I mean, we talked about the study question and how that informs the study design, and I think that we'll spend probably a fair amount of time on this slide just talking about well, who the target population is um, of the intervention, and so generally that's pretty well spelled out in the, in the study protocol. And you'll find most of that information when you look at the inclusion exclusion criteria, who's eligible for the study, who's not. And then typically 
the rules about inclusion and exclusion are really geared around safety. You know, you want to enroll participants who um, in the study who will be safe for them to participate. You want to exclude those where there's a potential hazard. And um, you also want to enroll people who are likely to get a benefit from the intervention or that you'd be able to assess um, a benefit um, from the intervention. And so typically those are the lines in which the inclusion exclusion criteria fall. Uh, but I know that, Ron, that you might have had something to add on that, so I'll turn it over to you and then I'll come back. Well, um, uh, again, drawing on um, our situation with the START study where people are going to be randomized, uh, randomly assigned into one or the other types of medication. Um, people will call in and they will say, gee, I, I, I want to I wanna join your study, but I want to guarantee that I, I'm going to get that particular medication. Um, and, and research assistants, the people that are doing the telephone screening, can't go making promises about that. Uh, because it is a random assignment, and if they make a promise and the person doesn't get that particular promised assignment, they're very likely to drop out of the study. Also, uh, research assistants have to be very clear about what rules somebody out of the study and not just sort of out of the goodness of their heart, quote unquote, uh, go ahead and try to admit somebody who clearly doesn't meet the rules for who gets included in the study. Um, if uh, in the START study a research assistant is interviewing somebody on the telephone and this person admits to currently uh, uh, being addicted to benzodiazepines like Xanax or Clonopin, uh, in addition to opioids, the research assistant has to say, gee, I'm, I'm sorry, I understand that you need treatment and you are looking for treatment and funded treatment is important to you, but really I, I can't help you with this study because you don't meet uh, the criteria for the study. Um, as, as many of the, re of the experienced research assistants in your nose will attest, um, it can create a lot of, of uh, problems, concerns, issues, however you want to say it, if, if those inclusion and exclusion criteria are not um, politely but strictly adhered to. Yeah, and just want to just add a little bit to that, um, considering the criteria and, and what that impact on the generalizability of the results. And I think, and I'm not a statistician, and so, um, you know, I know we have folks on the call representing the DSC who might want to add something, but it really is important for a couple of reasons to make sure that we're adhering to the inclusion exclusion criteria. Uh, we set up the target population, and we want to be able to say that the results of our study are generalizable to who. And so when we report the findings of the study, people are going to want to know, well, what kind of people do those findings apply to? And really that that's set up by who we included and excluded from the study. And so we need to be able to say that it is what the protocol says that it is. And so often if you um, veer from that, there is a possibility that you're going to introduce some confounding variables, um, I might say, or some biases into the study because the population is a little bit different than what you're saying it is. Uh, the other thing is it helps other investigators when you're reporting the findings assess whether the merits and the appropriateness of the intervention. So um, maybe we designed a study to do something, but the population of people we included weren't the right kinds of people to, in order to see the effect. And so maybe while the study didn't show an intervention effect, it could be because we didn't study the right people. And so being able to describe um, accurately who was included in the trial is really important. So adherence to those eligibility criteria are really important. And so I would just encourage folks, and, and we have seen that often, is we get questions. Um, most times the inclusion and exclusion criteria are pretty well specified or the intention is to have them well specified because if they're ambiguous, we invite problems and we invite maybe some um, fuzziness in terms of our sample. But they generally are pretty well spelled out, but we still get questions about whether or not it's appropriate to include. And I think some of what happens is 
we have a desire to include people in the study. People present, they, they have a need, they sometimes they need treatment, and oftentimes in, in uh, the CTN studies we're, we're testing existing standards of care, maybe enhanced by an additional methodology or strategy, but typically we're testing treatment interventions. And so we want to see people get treatment. And so sometimes there is the concern about enrolling people in studies who don't meet the eligibility criteria. And then that has, of course, further implications on the data analysis side. Um, but just to be mindful as a research assistant of that possible motivation and really strict adherence is really what's, what's necessary in order to, for us to be able to say that we've done high quality, uh, well designed research. It's a it's a delicate balance. Yeah. On on the one hand, what you're trying to do is is test these interventions uh, that are being studied in as real world a population as you can, as Christy said earlier, so as to uh, make the results as generalizable and therefore as useful to the field of addiction treatment as possible. On the other hand, uh, sometimes you have to exclude people from that, and, and in most cases, this is about the safety of the individuals. Uh, 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 there are other times when the question has to be more narrowly drawn. In the case of a protocol where you're just looking at the effectiveness of this particular intervention with people who are stimulant addicts, that, that means that you might have to exclude people, and certainly will, that, that who are not stimulant addicts. It's not that you don't care about those people who aren't stimulant addicts. It is rather that the study question is focused on those particular individuals for scientific reasons. It's one of the jobs of those of us who work in community treatment programs to articulate to our clinical staff people who may or may not be working in the study about what those inclusion and exclusion criteria are so they're not distressed about why a particular person may be off of their current caseload or somebody that, that they've been interacting with in the community is not appropriate for inclusion in this particular study. And so uh, being very clear and very consistent about what these criteria are at all levels is an important part of the study. Mm-hmm. Great. And then our eligibility criteria also has some bearing on our recruitment efforts. Um, and so typically in the studies that we see in the CTN, our ex included and exclusion criteria is it so rigid um, because we want to test it in real world settings with real uh, participants and so not some kind of laboratory artificially um, made sample that won't be applicable to anyone beyond the study. Um, so. Generally, we don't have that many restrictions um, or re restrictions that are appropriate for the study, of course, but that may have bearing on your recruitment efforts. For example, if I would just use the example of the CTN 31 study and we have a participating site um, in Hawaii and um, that study is looking to enroll people who have some recent use and that recent use is defined by use within the last 60 days. And so one of the things that we found early on is that we were drawing from a sample of people who were coming from a residential program. And depending on the leaks of stay in that residential program, many of them didn't meet that criteria of that 60-day use. And so that eligibility criteria had to mold the pool of people through which we were recruiting subjects. And so uh, we learned pretty early on that maybe the residential program wasn't, shouldn't have been the primary recruitment pool and that um, getting some more direct IOP admissions would be more profitable for the study in terms of recruitment. And so the eligibility criteria really does guide some of your recruitment strategies. Um, the other thing is that I think that's all I want to say in terms of recruitment strategies. We have on the slide a little discussion of randomization, and I think we put it here just to emphasize the importance of randomization in a controlled clinical trial, because what you want to do is to be able to detect uh, intervention effects, and so what you want to have happen is that the difference between the intervention groups or the control group, let's say, is should just be the intervention, and so what you want to do is have comparable groups starting out at baseline, and so randomization achieve that for us. And so in, in our studies within the CTN, we um, utilize the DSC for that, and they contract with an IVRS center of interactive voice randomization system or something like that. That does our randomizations for us because we want to ensure 
that there is no bias in the allocation of subjects to a treatment condition. So it could be that if there was no randomization and someone walked in and said, oh, yeah, you really heavy user, I think you need the more intensive treatment and you're not so bad off, so maybe you can go with the standard of care. Obviously, something like that would bias the study results. And so what we want to do is take that decision making out of the hands of the local research team and allow it to happen by chance. And so that way we have a better chance of getting comparable groups. It doesn't ensure that the groups are identical, but I think for the most part, randomization achieves um, more or less compar comparable groups. And, and the reason that uh, randomization is also important is, is because we, in fact, don't know whether the experimental condition is superior or inferior to the control condition. That this um, um, very elaborate, nicely manualized uh, behavioral intervention may, in fact, not be any better than treatment as usual at a particular site. And so we're we're asking the scientific question because we don't know. And so we can't assume that we know which one is better. And so that's why randomization is important. We couldn't do, if we knew that the experimental condition was already had been established as superior to the control condition in every kind of study, we wouldn't have a study. Exactly. And it would be ethical to do a study if we had already known the results of that. And so. Yeah, that's an important point. So the other part, I think, of this slide is recruitment, retention, and return to follow-up. Now, one of the things I just would also say here that there is additional seminars that Liz has set up that has either occurred during the last seminar series or that will occur in the future. And I think that there may be a recruitment and retention seminar planned. And so we won't spend a whole lot of time here, but I think it really is the heart of what you do uh, in terms of you. I mean, research staff at, at the CTP, so research assistance coordinators. And so we do want to talk a little bit about successful recruitment efforts and how we go about being more successful, either recruitment, retaining, or hearing participants or, or tracking them later. And I think really one of the things that we want to emphasize is that your success really depends on developing a careful plan having multiple strategies, being flexible, and establishing some goals, and preparing to devote the necessary effort. And I think one of the things, particularly multi-center trials or just clinical trials in general, is recruitment is often one of the most difficult tasks. And invariably, participant recruitment is more difficult than we initially anticipate. So because we often are using limited resources and we have very limited time to conduct the trial, it's really important to have some planning or pre-planning, go into your recruitment efforts and how you're going to get your participants into the study. And um, and then also you do your planning, you strategize, you have your um, recruitment um, efforts planned to be flexible because, you know, what you might think worked in the last study, which may have worked very well, may not work for the current study, or strategies that you've used in the current study in the past may not work at this particular time. And so you just really want to have a plan in place because, unfortunately, when you're working in a multi-center trial with deadlines, there are people who are dependent on the study uh, finishing at a particular time. We can't afford to have um, unusually long lags, and so I think at least from um, the perspective of someone at the RTC, it's important to have some contingency plans in place. And so that might be getting some additional recruitment materials approved, um, talking about or getting approved some strategies to maybe go out to providers in the community to talk about the research, um, or various other things. And I know that there's probably a number of people on the call that have some very creative and useful ideas with regard to recruitment. But the point being here is that you just want to think about it in advance. And it's also one of the places where, where it's a pressure point in the study of the, in the conduct of the, of the protocol. Uh, there's always going to be pressure on, on recruitment, um, and, and the recruitment environment changes over time, which is one of the reasons that I want to echo um, Christie's call for flexibility of recruitment plans. Things can happen 
beyond the control of the study and the community treatment program that affect uh, recruitment, the availability or change in the availability of publicly funded treatment slots might be one of those things that when the study started it was hard for people to get um, publicly funded treatment in, of a particular type in the community and then partway through the study all of a sudden that environment changes or new treatment programs come online that, it, that, that attract patients from the potential pool of, of research participants that hadn't been there in the past. So flexibility is really the key and it's, it's I guarantee you recruitment will always be a topic on every protocol call that you're on for the entire duration of the study. Mm -hmm. And then just in terms of like additional reasons why it's important, for example, if you're conducting a study, you're hoping to get it done in one or two years and you have a really important research question to answer and you get your resources together, your staff are in place, and you're conducting a trial and you find it takes five years. It is possible that someone else has thought about the same question, is going to do that same study and finish ahead of, ahead of you. And so sometimes for scientific reasons, you might find that you start a study, but if it takes too long, there may be some new information that comes out into the, um, into the scientific community asking the question that you were attempting to ask. The other thing is when it takes um, longer logistically, it impacts resources, um, for sure resources, um, you may have staff, you may have staff turnover, and so it has kind of rippling effects throughout the study, and so you get sometimes um, kind of waning interest in, in, in a study that drags out too long. And so for the logistical reasons, it's important. And, um, and then often, or not often, sometimes we're a little over-optimistic in our projections. And so, for example, on the CTN27 START study, Initially, when the protocol development team um, met and talked and we rolled out what the expectations were going to be for recruitment in the study, there was um, a plan to enroll at least two participants a week. And that seemed reasonable to everyone, and so we, we went forth in the study, and very early on we realized that that probably was a little optimistic, and so there was some discussions that were had amongst the um, executive committee, amongst the sponsor, and even with the DSMB about revising those projections to something that we realized was a little more realistic. And so that might happen sometimes in the study, that um, what you thought you were going to do or what your projections were in reality are something different, and so you have to make adjustments. So it's not always that we've failed to plan or that we didn't work too, you know, hard enough in order to get the subject. That's, you know, in reality, like Ron pointed out, there's some other forces that sometimes impact our recruitment that were unforeseen at the time that we set up the study. As important as recruitment is, and it's certainly critical, it all starts with that, uh, keeping people in the study and exposing them to the intervention or the control uh, condition is uh, actually equally critical. You can mm -hmm. have a wonderful recruitment rate, but if you don't keep people in the study, things uh, go very badly. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and this is where the research staff can be uh, very key. I've, I've been blessed uh, here at my agency in the studies that we've done in the CTN that the research staff have really been extraordinary in helping people who were kind of tentative and maybe a little fractious in terms of staying in the study uh, to be in the study. And, and so it's the care and feeding of these re uh, of research subjects that are in the study that, that really help improve uh, and keep retention where it needs to be in order to get the treatment exposure that you need. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's an important point, too, to keep in mind is that in order to really test the intervention, we, we need to make sure that we're exposing the participant to the intervention. And so sometimes you have trouble when you have adherence problems, meaning it's, uh, compliance on the participant's part with coming in to visits, attending maybe treatment sessions or medication taking. And so what you might do is, unfortunately, what we might find ourselves in the position of having a less exposure to the intervention. And so when we want to go and make the assessment of the effect, 
we really have a diminished effect because we really didn't give um, the study participants the optimal dose of the intervention to be able to really see its effectiveness. And so that's some of the risks. And so we spend a lot of time talking about um, not only hope, helping people to stay in the study, uh, but also helping them to, to comply and get more of the study. And so, you know, like Ron pointed out, it has a lot to do with the staff. Um, there's some things that you can do even before a trial starts that could help with adherence. And it really, sometimes it's in the design. A longer trial is a harder to stick with. So if you design a 52-week study, you're trying to track people for 52 weeks coming in the clinic weekly, that may, may be a little more tough for people than a shorter trial. And so some of that happens in the design, and, and I know the protocol developers consider that um, when they set up the study. The other thing is making sure that you appropriately screen people before they come into the trial. Typically, some of the inclusion exclusion criteria you'll see things like plans to move out of the area uh, within the six months protocol um, duration, things like willingness to comply with study uh, procedures, because you really want to avoid setting yourself up with people who aren't going to adhere to the program, are going to be very challenging to keep in. And so your eligibility criteria sometimes gives you an opportunity to um, assess for that and check for that and whittle folks out who may not be appropriate for the study. So some of that you can do beforehand, but there's a lot that you can do during the trial and um, building really good rapport, um, helping the participant recognize and, and appreciate how important they are to the study, uh, making the clinic environment inviting and um, a, a nice place to be. Um, there's other suggestions about... Hey, Christy? Yeah, sorry. Hi, Ms. Evelyn. I'm sorry. I got a prompt from um, Anthony Floyd um, asking if we could discuss the need to couple meeting recruitment goals with participant safety and research ethics. Interesting. Can can we open the line and, and have Anthony kind of expand on that question? If he so desires. If Anthony could press star one, we can open up his line. And Anthony, your line is open. Please go ahead. Hi, this is Anthony. Anthony. Hi. Oh, I just wanted to see if you could expound a little bit on. Um, what we've talked about uh, you know a, a lot with with recruitment and just sort of making sure that it's clear that in the process of meeting these strenuous recruitment goals that we keep in mind um, the the other elements of you know safeguarding the participants and making sure that no shortcuts are, are taken in the process of trying to meet these study goals. Oh, right, right. That's a that's a good point. Um, this is an example of that, and thank you for, for mentioning that, Anthony. Sometimes, you know, like I think Ron mentioned the pressure, and typically recruitment is something that you'll feel pressure about as, as a study team because there's so many people who are watching those bottom line numbers. Um, what can happen, unfortunately, we'll get into data and um, things like scientific misconduct, which I kind of just threw out there, which doesn't affect anybody here, but um, the downside could be that we could be delivering messages about um, getting people into the study at whatever cost, and that really should not be the messages. And so, and that really hopefully isn't the message that, that folks get, but, but sometimes what you could have happen is a little relaxation of the eligibility criteria, like, well, you know, for example, 60 days criteria, well, it's just been 61 days, you know, so maybe there's something, you know, we can do to get that person in. And so there sometimes is a risk for that, and um, you just want to avoid it. In terms of safety, I would, I'm trying to think of a good example of a, a safety issue with regards to that. But let me, uh, let me, okay. uh, yeah. 
it, within each node, typically the conduct of the trial at the community treatment program is the human subjects uh, oversight goes to a, an institutional review board or human subjects committee, typically but not necessarily, at the local university. And it, as part of the protocol approved, they have a recruitment plan, they have recruitment strip, uh, scripts, they have recruitment posters, advertisements, et cetera, that have been uh, approved by that. And so if a community treatment program feels like they're not getting sufficient recruitment, they can't just launch out on a new strategy about recruitment with new scripts and new uh, new things without uh, and new um, posters, et cetera, without going back through their IRB to get approval to do that because it has an impact on on uh, participant safety and, and, and research ethics. That's another mm -hmm. example of why you can't just succumb to the pressure and start uh, uh, creating things outside of what's already been approved by the various regulatory bodies. Yeah. So it has a potential to harm study subjects in terms of safety and also really have a negative uh, influence on the science. And so no, no one is served by those sorts of, of practices. Did I answer your question, Anthony? Yes, thank you very much. You bet. Okay. Great question. The uh, last thing I want to say, I think we want to say about follow-up, if we're done with retention, Christy, is that um, you can recruit a lot of folks, you can retain them and, and expose them to the study, but if you don't, can't follow up with a, a significant percentage of them at the various time points that have been articulated within the study, um, you don't have any kind of uh, results that are going to be worthwhile that are going to make the overall study um, impact the uh, or influence community practice. Mm -hmm. And so we're not going to, uh, since there is a specific webinar and training on 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 recruitment, retention, and follow up. I think it's probably we probably said enough about this. Unless there's uh, some burning uh, questions out there, or some point that you want to make, Chrissy, about follow up. No, I think that's great. All righty. Okay. So let's spend a little time talking about data collection and data management and um, standards of quality. And so there is a tremendous amount of information that we collect and process on a regular basis when we're doing research. And so um, particularly in multi-center trials, we want to emphasize standardization and doing things the same way. What we don't want to have is, you know, eight individual sites doing things a little bit differently. And so a lot of um, things have been done and built into the study to maximize the quality of data. And um, I just would say also that some differences is, are probably unavoidable, and, and that typically happens. But I think we can minimize it a lot with proper training, um, certification, retesting, monitoring, and retraining staff if need be. And so a lot of um, what you can do to maximize the quality of data really is in the design of your protocol and the operations manual. Um, you want to make sure your procedures are clear so that staff don't have to interpret what they have to do because the interpretation of one person at one time may be different from what another person in another site may interpret the question to be. And so I would just emphasize here that um, collecting all the data, collecting the data accurately, and then having, if there's questions about how to do certain things, is that those questions are posed to likely your chain of command. So you may deal with it within your node, or you may escalate the question up or the concern up to the lead node and things like that. Um, so let me just go over a little bit about kind of data problems that you might typically see, and I'm sure the folks on the call from the DSE may have things to offer in that in that regard. But typical problems are missing data. So you have participants in the trial who don't come in and do visits, and so you don't get the data, or maybe for whatever reason, staff error, um, maybe um, carelessness in places. Um, we don't complete the forms that we're supposed to complete. And so 
one indication of data quality is really the amount of missing data. And so we see that accumulating as the study moves forward, but I, I know that the DSC probably deals with that far much more than we do when they take a look at the data set um, at the end of the trial. Um, the other kinds of data problems that you might see are incorrect data. So putting information into a field that's incorrect, either you interpret the question incorrectly and you put um, valid information in there that's not the question being asked, and so that might be erroneous data. Sometimes it could be transcription errors. Um, that might be easily detected, and then sometimes they aren't. For example, I'll give you a blood pressure. You might transpose numbers, um, and it's a valid blood pressure, but it's wrong, and so that's erroneous data. And sometimes problems with data are the variability. So you might have variability within a site and maybe even from site to site. So one clinician may do an assessment one way by one standard, and then you may have another clinician who interprets it a little bit differently, doing things a little different, and so there's no comparability and standardization in the way the data is collected. So those are all kinds of data problems. And so when I talk about maximizing um, the quality of data, protocol design and operations manual really, I think, is the front line defense against that sort of thing. And I guess I just want to, I know that Anthony Floyd is on the call, and just kind of just give him a shout out with regard to one of the things that he's developed for the trial that he's running, with, which is the CTN31 um, trial, um, is a discussion board. Because what we know is that you want to document clarifications that are sent out. And, you know, even when you start a trial, you don't have all of the answers. And sometimes when you roll out the study, you realize things that you didn't know, and so there's some adjustments or modifications that have to be made to procedures, and you want to be able to document that, and so, and then disseminate that to other sites who may have similar questions or similar problems. And so there's a discussion board that they've created um, where sites can go and ask a question and have an answer provided to that question, and that information is shared study-wide and in that database hopefully can be archived later and uh, maintained as a part of the study record. And so that's a really great way to maximize quality and standardization. Um, the other thing is you can look at your form design. And, and the DSC is responsible for this, but with consultation from the lead team um, about what CRFs are needed for the study. And so the way we design our forms and making them clear, um, brief, collecting only the necessary data, those things can help um, minimize data problems because you'll get the information that you need, you'll get it concisely, you'll get it correctly. Um, so forms help in that process. And of course, training. And so typically in the CTN, you'll have, prior to the rollout of a study, a national training where the lead investigative team and the clinical coordinating center, the data center will come together and bring all of the investigative sites and go over from A to Z all the aspects of the trial that are going to be needed in order to run a trial at the um, trial site. And so that's an essential element to making sure that the data that we're going to be collecting in the trial is going to be accurate and complete. And then the pretesting that we put on there really has to do with, and I think it's a, um, a strategy used within the CTN, which I, I like, and unfortunately for the CTN um, 27 um, start study, we didn't have that mechanism in place, but I know that there is a format of using a wave one, wave two, whereas um, the trial protocol can roll out with a few sites, and you can kind of work out the kinks and, and learn from um, the study in real, kind of piloting the protocol, and then come back and make adjustments either to the protocol to the operation manual before you involve the rest of the trial sites. And so that kind of pre-testing helps to identify problems and get them addressed in, in an effort to um, maximize quality um, when you um, roll out the study overall. And then just the mention of the electronic data capture center, because when you talk about data and all the data that goes in, I think one of the wonderful advents that we're using within the CTN is electronic data capture. And it has so many benefits in that you can enter data in real time and get real life feedback based on pre-programmed data checks. And so if you enter faulty data or something that's out of range, 
that you can get a query back immediately and it will force you before moving on to address that query. And so that's one of the things that also occur in order to help um, maximize quality data. CTN, I think we're moving toward, and, and maybe Debbie or someone else from the DSC can talk about more, a more of an electronic data capture system and kind of moving away from paper. I don't know that we're there yet, but trials are doing more and more electronic source as opposed to paper, which has its benefits of what can be perceived or what I hear sometimes as a drawback is we're motivated to keep our pieces of paper and there's lots of information that you collect from people and you may not have your computer readily uh, available to you. And so you end up creating source docs and then that source doc would have to be maintained and then you have an issue of transcription or data entry and so sometimes it complicates the process when you do that. Um, but you know, you, you um, I think I lost my train of thought with that one, Ron. <laughs> you well, I, I, I think I think you said it well enough, and yeah. and I'm I'm also mindful of our time. I think it's probably time to move on unless folks um, have have any more questions. I know that the folks at uh, DCRI do a great job of of training people on their electronic data capture as a protocol is uh, starting to ramp up and, and also training new staff who come on to a protocol that's already in operation. So I don't think we need to say much more about that. Great. Thank you. So, um, okay, so reporting and monitoring, and this is, I think, will be brief for us, but you, we can't talk about clinical trials and, and, and the use of human subjects of research and not talk about safety. And so. Uh, while we concern ourselves with the quality of data and the amount of data, recruiting and maintaining <clears throat> people in the study, we want to make sure that we're doing things that maximize participant safety and so minimizing participant risk. And so often there's an assessment of adverse reactions that need to be done and that are called for in the protocol and that are called for based on our um, obligations to our regulatory bodies. And you want to make sure that you're monitoring those and reporting those accurately and timely. Uh, one of the things that I think when we talk about the effectiveness of the intervention, yes, we want to see how effective it is, but it's also important to, to provide information back into the community about how safe a particular intervention is. And so sometimes we were doing medication trials or there may be a device trial, you know, behavioral trials, people tend to worry less about safety, but the reality is safety is an issue no matter what kind of trial you're doing. Um, and so you want to make sure that um, if the protocol calls for weekly monitoring, that you're checking in with staff, uh, with participants about how they're doing, how they're feeling, if any adverse reactions have occurred, and those get documented appropriately in the database. Um, that that's kind of it on safety, Ron. Unless you have something to add to that. No, I don't. I'm, I'll I'll move along and talk about QA. Yeah. There's there is a, a, understandably a lot of emphasis on quality assurance. The the stakes involved in these studies are quite high, both in terms of of money that's being invested, um, the potential of improvement of addiction treatment. Uh, and so it, it, you should expect that there are going to be a lot of people looking over your shoulder, almost regardless of at what level you exist in a particular protocol, to make sure that you are doing uh, the protocol properly. And so typically in a study, each node has its own quality assurance uh, process. For example, in our node in the START study, um, uh, Anthony Floyd a a comes out and, and is assisted by others doing uh, a monitoring visits to make sure that we're adhering to the protocol, that we're not doing something that is in violation of, of what the rules set forth in the protocol are. A and that helps us uh, to get ready for the, the larger uh, uh, audits or, or monitoring visits that are done uh, typically by EMIS and DCRI. The DCRI audits are more commonly just paying attention to the data that's coming in through their electronic data capture system, but 
Emmis, the clinical coordinating center, also has uh, site monitors who come out and, and routinely visit us to make sure that we're adhering to the protocol at all levels. And, and this helps us keep our eye on the ball, making sure that we're delivering things properly, that we are protecting our uh, participants, and that we're delivering the study as it's intended. Um, I, I think that's about all I want to say about QA. Uh, Christy, anything more from you about QA? No, just to, to echo what you said, the monitors really are your friends, and I know that for me, being a research assistant or a coordinary analyst, sometimes it didn't feel that way um, when they came out and they were checking your books, but, you know, I just think it's important to recognize that we need to maintain positive relationships with our monitors and really use them as resources, and it keeps us all, you know, it serves us all at the site level, making sure participants are, safety is protected, the data is coming in as it should, and the sponsor is happy with the quality of the trial. And so I, I just echo that um, the monitors are your friends, and, and as a research assistant, sometimes you just want to keep that in mind. Yeah, and monitors at every level. I, they're, they're there to help you uh, help make the study the best it can be. Um, and so those monitors also have people who are paying attention to their reports. and, and um, there are a variety of elements that I'm now on the regulatory oversight um, uh, bullet there, and I'm first of all, I want to talk about um, the DSMB, the Data Safety and Monitoring Board. Um, every study, regardless of whether it exists within the CTN or even outside the CTN, um, has this Data Safety and Monitoring Board, and, and these are uh, a group of, of uh, research experts and treatment experts who who are responsible for monitoring the progress of the study. They're not materially involved in the conduct of the study in any way. As, as a matter of fact, they have to be distanced from the study, and their role is to make sure that the human subjects are being protected. They are the ones who take a look at these adverse events and say, boy, what's going on there? It looks like a lot of people are, might be having some untoward reactions to this particular medication and, and question whether it's ethical to, or safe, actually, to, to go any further, and so forth and so on. And that's also the role of the institutional review boards, which exist. Um, uh, the DSMBs typically exist one for each protocol. So there's a DSMB that the uh, Center for the Clinical Trials Network puts together for the START study or for the Stage 12 study and so forth and so on. IRBs exist, as we've talked about, within each node, and they are responsible for taking a look at how the, the study is doing at their particular site, not in the same way that the Data Safety and Monitoring Board does, but, but they are also the recipients of information about protocol violations and the like. Clearly, the, NIDA, uh, the National Institute on Drug Abuse is concerned about the uh, conduct of the trial and the degree to which there are um, uh, other co-sponsors in this, uh, then they are also going to be concerned. We haven't uh, had the opportunity yet to have a, a trial in the CTN co-sponsored by NIAAA, but that could conceivably happen, and so NIAAA and its, uh, in its uh, QA efforts and regulatory oversight would be a part of it. And then last but not least, we have the executive committee for that particular protocol, and, and um, both looking at how the trial is being conducted and how it's affecting uh, the safety of participants is something that the executive committee pays attention to as well. And lastly, I want to circle back to the DSMB. If there is a very clear and dramatic benefit uh, for one arm versus the other, it, 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 in terms of, of outcomes to patients, it is the role of the DSMB to say, gee, it's time to stop this protocol, the, the questions have been answered, um, just like it would be their job to stop the protocol if there was a clear compromise to patient safety as a result of the exposure to, uh, to the experimental condition. So uh, that's what I want to say about regulatory oversight. Christy, anything more? That's great. Okie doke. So we're moving along. Study's over. Hooray. Time to close it out. Yeah, yeah. So, and that typically is a very complex process that requires a whole lot of planning. And so, um, we do our jobs the best we can do um, during the study, and then there's a process for 
data cleanup and verification. Um, even if we do the best job we can do, sometimes there's final editing and cleaning that has to occur. So that um, is important and the timing of that is important too so that we don't drag out the, the trial much longer than it should. And so a lot of cleaning happens in real time, but there obviously will be a period of time after the study where that would need to occur and so we need to have staff in place on site to deal with some of that cleaning. Um, also part of closeout, we have uh, a need to store the study materials. Those data need to be organized and um, you need to consider logistics of space, you know, um, filing, boxes, um, and the cost and how long you need to store those items. And they really do need to be available because you have the potential for even after study closeout to have an audit, an audit by any of the regulatory bodies that Ron just mentioned. Um, the IRB, FDA, it was a study that was being um, submitted to FDA. And so you want to make sure that it's organized in such a way that you'll be able to get access to it um, if the time were to come. And then scientifically, sometimes um, there may be an occasion for another investigator down the road to want to design a similar study, and there may be information that they want to know about your study and, and, and how it was conducted that may be outside of the publication. And so they may contact the investigator for, for, for further information. So you want to be able to have those records available to be able to access to get some of those questions answered. And so uh, that's the issue with closeout. But it really is a pretty lengthy process. And, and um, it happens. And we usually have a, a SOP for how it's going to occur. And, and we just move through it. Um, okay, in terms of data analysis, you know, again, like I said earlier, I'm not a statistician, so I don't have a whole lot to offer in this way. But that's a typical section of a protocol that you'll see, and it's been vetted by the, the data center, the lead investigators, the statisticians. And, and um, one of the things I think that bears for the research assistant and the coordinator is that um, the better that we can do in terms of making sure the data are clean, the data are complete, I think it minimizes the likelihood of problems in terms of analysis in that um, subjects have to be removed or withdrawn from the analysis. And because we know that that's bad um, because it has the potential to bias the study results. And so we want to have everyone who's enrolled in the trial be included, and we want to have all the information that's going to be necessary for them to do their job. And so, of course, primary outcome data is really important. Um, but also baseline data so we can see who was in the trial, what were their baseline condition before the intervention and things like that. And so um, as much as we can do about keeping clean data, high quality, I think the better um, it is when it comes to time for a data analysis. In the final analysis, uh, to use that term again, it's all in the results. So the reason that we uh, expend all this energy, you know, all this person power, the reason that we um, spend all of these all these taxpayer dollars is to try to inform the field about what we learned as a result of that study. Um, each protocol has its own um, research result writing report writing plan, um, and the principal investigator and the writing team are are responsible and and sort of held accountable in doing that by the sponsor by the Center for the Clinical Trials Network, uh, by the principal investigator uh, team, and so forth and so on. And so there is a, a great push to once the study has been completed, the follow-ups done, the data analyzed, to get that information out into the public domain. Um, because without that publication, there is no study. Um, the formal process within the CTN is after the, there's an expectation that uh, as soon as possible after all the work is done that uh, the um, results of the main trial, in other words, uh, what the central question, the principal question of the research study, uh, will there will be a publication about what the study found as it relates to that. So for example, Dr. Ling and the protocol team in the START study will be responsible for public, uh, publishing a study that described whether or not there were any differential effects on liver function between exposure to methadone versus exposure to uh, buprenorphine, um, uh, Narcan, in, or naloxone in, in that particular study. That's the main trial um, uh, results. Um, the Publications Committee, uh, led by Dr. George Bigelow, is a formal um, structure within the CTN comprised of a number of individuals whose job it is 
first of all, to, to monitor and urge uh, completion of these publications by the protocol uh, report writing team, and then to review those. Uh, so there is a peer review process within the CTN before those um, uh, research um, submissions, those manuscripts are submitted to peer-reviewed journals to make sure that the, the, that the scientific question and, and all of the elements of the research report are articulated correctly. Uh, so there's, there's literally a QA process for the research manuscripts being submitted within the, uh, within the CTN. Um, moreover, and they, and they not only look at things like the manuscripts, but they also look at posters that might be, uh, that the research team might be wanting to submit to uh, national conferences, um, for example, like the College on the Problems of uh, Drug Dependence, or CPDD. The research, uh, the Publications Committee will be looking at that, so there's a formal process. Um, moreover, uh, Again, circling once again back to Dr. Lesner's vision of, of improving um, clinical practice using science as a vehicle, the National Institute on Drug Abuse has partnered with CSAT and its Addiction Technology and Transfer Centers, or ATTCs, to, to construct what are called blending products. Um, these uh, take their origin from studies that have been completed within the CTN. Uh, products are put together for the consumption, for the use by community treatment programs of things we've learned from those trials. For example, um, there's a, a blending product called Mia Steps, uh, and this is basically how to supervise the utilization of motivational interviewing within clinical practice in a, in a CTP. Um, it had its origins in some early studies conducted within the CTN. Those studies informed the construction of this blending product. That was the science that underlies that, and the ATTCs, which assist in the assembling of these blending products, also have a material role in, in providing free trainings for those particular blending products. And so, for example, there's a MIA step training happening in my node uh, in a few weeks. So um, this is a way to try to disseminate this science, not just rely on community treatment providers to read peer-reviewed journals, but, but to translate those findings into products and, and trainings that can help prepare staff to utilize these research results. Um, I think that's all I want to say about blending products. Uh, Christy, anything more from you? Uh, no. Okay. Okie doke. So I'll move along. I'll move us along to the next one. So we got one of those polling questions. All right. All right. Which of the following documents are essential for ensuring that research study is conducted in a standardized manner? That was very interesting. I'm seeing the, the responses come through. I don't know if the callers are able to see that, but it seems to be pretty evenly divided between the first option, research protocol, operations manual, and SOPs, and then the last option, which is all of the above. And um, Some well, folks aren't answering. <laughs> yeah. That too. Maybe they're divided as well. But I think what, the, where we were going with this one, I know typically in all of the above would seem like the, the right answer, uh, but there was a sort of a zinger in there in that contract um, option. So what we were looking for was research protocol, operation manual, and SOPs. And the contracts just typically say how the money is going to be spent. They don't mm -hmm. necessarily say about the standardization of the research study itself. Yeah. We have a whole bunch of answers being changed now. We're getting there. <laughs> there now. We're almost there. We just got four more. <laughs> We're going to talk you into the right answer. <laughs> All right. I'm going to put a right. presentation now. Great. Well, um, 
now we're on to uh, the final topic for today's webinar. And so thanks to everybody for hanging in there. And uh, we're sort of getting close to the end. Um, uh, I want to talk about the first bullet, that ultimately the success of conducting these trials within the CTN is about relationships. Like everything else in life, um, it, is, it is all about relationships. And within the CTP, it, there, there, it takes care and feeding for there to be um, beneficial, supportive relationships between the research and non-research staff. I've learned the hard way over the years that, that if I don't work hard at integrating and, and, and keeping the research staff as part of, of the agency, uh, and, and just everything from um, eating in the lunchroom to, to being on, on, on the CTPs, uh, committees and the like are important to weave this into the day-to-day -day existence. And that's in many cases when a protocol comes along and you need to rely on internal uh, referrals for recruitment, that this is the way that it happens. And there's, it, it takes away the mystery. And also between the community treatment program and the node itself. Uh, ideally, uh, when a, a node has applied for membership in the CTN or applied for renewal, they've reached out into the community for community treatment programs with which they already have a, a good relationship, a good working relationship. But like all relationships, that it takes care and feeding. It doesn't just happen overnight, and it doesn't just stay that way because it, it started that way. And and. Uh, you, all of us on this call and people who aren't on the call but are part of the CTN are responsible for um, continuing to work on these relationships. And then last but not least, there has to be um, a good relationship within the protocol team. That's the reason for all these calls. Um, Christy is going to say more about communication in a little bit, but the communication, like every other form of human relationship, is, is important in the care and feeding of that relationship. Without communication, yeah, yeah, get out there on an island. So, um, there, if there's one thing that I would would say as a, as a, a word of advice to everybody on the call is that you can't undervalue the importance of these relationships in ensuring the success of the trial. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you, Ron. And and I would just kind of just echo and 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 follow up with what you're saying. It's like often. In multi-center trials, because they're so complex, because they involve so many people in geographically different places, um, the relationships are important. And how to maintain those relationships, really, we have to have open communication and regular communication. And I think that that's part of one of uh, the messages that we want to leave you with as well, is that um, to nurture these relationships, we have to stay in communication. And so uh, while the relationship may have existed at the start of the study, we need to make sure it is intact and well at the end of the study, too. And sometimes the communications might be challenged. I mean, maybe there's, there's problems um, that have occurred during the study, but, but having the relationship and communicating openly and regularly, I think we um, can minimize the potential for problems. Because, I mean, no matter how well we design the study and how um, well the protocol is written and how detailed our operations manual um, is, things will occur and things will come up that may have been unexpected. And so I think the way that we can manage them more effectively is to stay in communication. So typically what you'd find is that uh, the protocol team will organize regular conference calls. Um, if, if there is an opportunity for in, um, face to face meetings, those will occur too, usually at the beginning of the study. But often, if we're able to do one in conjunction with a steering committee, um, most protocol teams will try to organize that. Um, but so we get together as, as much as possible. And then email is a great um, technology that is used as well. And uh, the point here on the slide is that email serves as documentation oftentimes because, you know, if it's not written down, it didn't happen, and sometimes you need to uh, put your, your question in writing and be able to have that response in writing for your regulatory binder or for further reference down the road. And so email is really important in that whole communication loop. And then it also gives you an opportunity to get feedback into the system because the research staff at the clinics are, you know, that's where the rubber meets the road. I oftentimes hear um, people say that you guys are doing the work in a clinic, and sometimes 
the protocol development team who are disconnected from that may not get the opportunity to see it in practice. And so there may be some needs for adjustment, modification, and so it's really important that the, the local team understands and recognizes their role in giving feedback to the system so that appropriate changes can be made, whether that's to maximize participant safety or to address a particular problem with the data. Um, but communication essentially um, is really, really important. So we say communicate, communicate, and that really goes for internally at the site as well. We talked about those relationships with research staff versus non-research staff, regular staff meetings, um, research staff meetings, clinical staff meetings, all staff meetings. The, the more that we're able to um, touch base and troubleshoot and problem solve together, I think the better off we'll be. Great. Um, and so I think that takes us to another polling question. Interesting. Your last polling question. All right. So let's see. Here we go. So what are some ways you can facilitate a successful study in the CTN? <laughs> Here's to the protocol be as interactive with the research team as possible. 100% of all 14, well, okay, all 1921 people. All right, the, the precincts haven't closed yet here. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to get all those those ballots counted. Yeah. Okay, 22, 25. I'll go ahead and show the results to everybody. The idea okay. was to drive home that um, there are very important aspects to facilitating success in the study. And, uh, Liz, remind me, how do they evaluate this uh, this webinar? Actually, thanks. That's a great segue. I am going to email a link to everybody because uh, your feedback is very important to us and we are constantly evaluating and looking for ways to improve seminars and bring other opportunities to the CTN. Everybody will get an email from me with a link to electronically submit their evaluation at the seminar. And all submissions are anonymous and we greatly appreciate it. And we do look at those very seriously for ways to improve future seminars. Thanks, Ron. Sure. Okay. And do we have one slide, Liz? I have a summary slide here. Okay. Okay, great. So, uh, well-designed clinical trials adhering to these fundamental principles have the opportunity to do all the things that you see listed there. And so, um, we protect human research participants, we protect our, our staff, ourselves, and the public interest, and ensure the continued support for clinical trials by maintaining high standards. And then I think, Ron, maybe just to bring it back to the point that you emphasized in the beginning, the whole idea is that we're bridging the gap in, from research to practice. And I think that the better able we are to do these things well, the more likely it is that these findings will be integrated back into the community and um, be useful for treating the participants or the, the people suffering from, from substance abuse problems in the general community. So um, we'll just continue to try to do our jobs well. I don't know if you have anything to add to that. I've always felt like the CTN was on the frontiers of, of uh, moving science into practice and, and that we, we, all of us in the CTN, regardless of what our position and our role and responsibility might be, it is ultimately our responsibility to, to do this correctly. I remember Alan Lesner at a steering committee meeting very early on in the history of the CTN basically looking at the audience and says, this is a big opportunity, don't screw it up. And, and I've never forgotten that admonition, and I think it's important uh, to think of it from a positive standpoint is we have a great opportunity here to, to help uh, improve treatment for people who suffer with addiction, and, and we need to use every effort that we can to make that happen. So I'll get off that soapbox <laughs> and ask if there are any other questions out there, any, anything in the last few minutes here that you'd like for us to address that we haven't talked about. And uh, we just want to say thank you also uh, for all of your attention and, and input throughout the day. All right, Ron, I'm going to conclude to keep a couple minutes to submit questions if they do have any questions. I'm going to put a screen up to show people what the upcoming seminars will be. Um, go back to the last slide. Okay, so 
So I'll just chat here for a minute. There was um, some reference to AE and SAE training. So I wanted to bring everybody's attention to the fact that LiveLink has a full library of training resources on hand for everybody. So if you do not have a link to LiveLink, ask your coworkers to how you go ahead and get that set up. We have training on the timeline follow-back, recruitment and retention, um, how to differentiate between an AE and an SAE, and how to um, handle them, informed consent. We had um, Anthony Floyd and Amanda Moore taught an IRB and regulatory documentation training. We had a HIPAA training. And there's a recording on good clinical practice overview, which could be uh, a resource for getting a GCP refresher course on hand. Uh, the catalog came out very recently, which can give you guys information on upcoming trainings. Our next seminar will be the Site Management Tools and Practice Workshop Series. And we do, as referenced earlier, have another seminar coming up on recruitment and retention, as well as quality assurance and site monitoring visits. So there's a lot of good resources out there for you. Um, kind of keep your ear to the ground and um, find out what kind of information is out there. If you're not sure, send us a message here at the CCC, and that's the um, CPN training at ms.com or you can send it directly to me, and that's ebatria at ms.com. And I would, again, like to thank Ron and Christy for sharing all their expertise. This is very, very important information, and this is absolutely vital in succession planning throughout the network. I thank you again. Thank you, Liz, and, and thank you, Ron, too. It's been great. So we've appreciated it. I've definitely appreciated um, speaking to you all today. So hopefully you got some valuable information. Thanks, everybody. Take care of yourselves. Okay, bye-bye. Thanks again. And that does conclude today's conference. We thank you for your participation. Have a wonderful day.